Okay, by now you should have taken your quiz on uh, the previous lesson we had last week. We're going to start continuing talking about lies in the textbooks, things that have been proven wrong a long time ago that are still taught to the kids every week all across the world. It's not just America. I collect textbooks. I've got them from other countries, and every time I go, I've been to 26 countries. I look in their textbooks. They still teach the same things. This is a universal problem, or at least a worldwide problem. They're teaching the kids the horse used to have four toes, and it slowly evolved into a one-toed horse. This whole story was made up in 1874. Let's review a couple of dates here. Back in 1859, Darwin's book was written. 1859. Darwin predicted, we will find evidence for my theory. <clears throat> the theory, of course, says that all life forms have a common ancestor. He said this in 1859, and most scientists at this time rejected it. They said, this is a stupid idea, this is a dumb theory. A few preachers, liberal preachers, who at the same time, there, there was quite a bit of uh, discussion going on about the accuracy of the Bible, and especially in Germany, they were called the higher critics. They were saying, well, the Bible can't be true because, uh, you know, we know the earth is millions of years old. <clears throat> and so they're really attacking the Bible on all sides from during the mid-1800s, the higher critics were. So Darwin's book came out and said, all life forms have a common ancestor. Hmm. They said, and Darwin said in his book, we should find evidence for my theory. Over the next 15 or 20 years, a lot of people began to manufacture evidence. What's one of the ones we talked about in the last class about uh, one of the things they document, or they, uh, in the last CSE 102, things they, 1869, a professor made up some evidence and was later proven wrong. Who remembers that one? He said, we can prove all, ans all animals have a common ancestor because during, as they're developing inside the mother, they have gill slits. Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel, correct. Made that up in 1869. 1874, it was proven wrong. Still in textbooks today, used in our county. All over the world, they're still using this, even though it's been proven wrong since 126 years ago. 1874 also, a guy named Othniel Marsh. What a first name, huh? That Bible name. N-I-E-L. Othniel C. Marsh. He was a fossil hunter, I, I believe. Uh, he made money hunting dinosaur fossils and stuff like that and bring, digging them out and setting them up in museums. They would buy them off him. Othniel Marsh picked animal skeletons that he had found, or that other people had found, picked them from all over the world, and put them together in a series for, I believe it was for Harvard, and they still have, the muse still have it on display, at Peabody Museum. I, I believe that's the one that got his original one. But he found a little bitty animal about the size of a fox, and then he found a big, slightly bigger animal, and a bigger one, and a bigger one, up to, all the way up to a horse. He arranged them in this order you see in your textbooks, from the Hyracotherum, up through the different kinds of horse-like uh, animals, up to the modern horse called Equus. He put the animals in this order, never did find them in that order. He just It's like finding an animal here, an animal on some other continent, and saying, wow, this one evolved into this one. Did not find them in that order, did not even find them in the same place. He just arbitrarily arranged this order out of, the, out of his imagination. That is still being taught in textbooks today, as evidence for evolution. What he did not tell the folks, and I think they should have, is that this is not scientific. This is just pure theoretical that we have this belief. It's interesting to note, the so-called ancient horse, is a, it's a meat-eating animal, has sharp teeth, where horses do not have sharp teeth. This little bitty animal has 18 pairs of ribs. The next one in his series has only 15 pairs of ribs. Now what would cause an animal to lose? You see, when you lose a complete set of ribs, you also lose the backbone that they attach to. You, lose the, you have to change the nerve system. You have to change the muscular system. You have to change the blood, the circulatory system. It's a major change. If I wanted you to change your car from running on four wheels to running on three wheels, what all would you have to change? <laughs> a lot of stuff, right? The braking system, the steering system, the balance of the car. I mean, it's a major overhaul. And yet they're teaching this stuff, not only that it happened, but that it happened by chance. 
It wasn't designed, it just happened. Then the next so-called ancient horse had 19 pairs of ribs. So now you have another major serious problem. How are you going to get all this new nervous system, new muscular system? How's this animal going to survive? What about coordination? What about reproduction? Who's this 19 paired rib horse going to, going to mate with? It's got to, you've got to have a male and a female evolve at the same time, in the same place. It's a big world, you know. <laughs> and they've got to find each other. You have a real serious problem. Now, I don't care if somebody wants to believe this, but that's not science, that's religion. Then it goes back to 18 pairs of ribs for the modern horse today. So, it, it's just baloney. But it's every textbook I've seen in, in countries around the world. Here's a textbook from Ireland telling the kids we've got evidence from evolution. The problem is this whole thing was proven wrong in, eight, in 1950. Now, it never was true. But back in 1950, a, a major... Uh, evolutionist named G.G. Simpson say, hey folks, it's not true. Anybody that studies horses will tell you there's a large variety of horses alive right now. And the horse and the zebra and the mule can all be interbred. A lady just wrote me a letter and sent me a bunch of pictures of her zorse. She says, I have a zebra stallion and I have a zebra mare and I have a mule stallion and a mule mare and I have horses. And she said, I crossbreed all of them every which way. She said if the, oh, I got pictures about that. She said if the male is the zebra, then it's called a zorse. If the male is the uh, horse and the female is a zebra, then it's, they got another name for it or something like that. They cross ponies and zebras and get a zioni. Uh, there's, web, there's several websites about this competition. Who can produce the best zioni and who can produce the best zorse and all this kind of stuff. Back in, uh, in this biology textbook, they said the, other examples, including the much-repeated gradual evolution of the modern horse, has not held up under close examination. What are they saying here? In other words, it's not true. All right? 1950, G.G. G. Simpson, George Gaylord Simpson, who was a strong believer and a proponent of evolution, he wrote a book, or wrote an article in Scientific Monthly, 1950, October, that said many examples commonly cited, such as the evolution of the horse family, or of saber-toothed tigers can be readily shown to have been unintentionally falsified. In other words, it's not true. It was falsified. It's been proven to be incorrect. So here's the problems with the horse evolution. This would be a good quiz question. What's, how do we know this is, or what's the problems with this teaching? It was made up by Othniel Marsh in 1874 from fossils scattered all over the world. Now, if you were going to take this to a court of law and say, I have proof for evolution because of this horse series, any freshman law student would say, Your Honor, he didn't even find these in the same place. He certainly didn't find them in the same order. And even finding fossils in order doesn't prove anything. See, the whole problem is evolution does not have to be proven in a court of law. It only has to be made believable for the students to fall for it. And they do by the millions, okay? A Russian scientist found modern horses in layers lower than the so-called ancient horse. Now, here's how evolution is supposed to work. They say we've got these different layers of rock, and each one is a different age, and it all means something. Now, we covered earlier in seminar part CSE 102, those layers don't mean anything. They're not different ages. But you got use a typical textbook. I have a cross-section showing the different layers of the earth, and they'll say this one is real old down here, and this one is the newest one on top. So, according to the theory, you should find modern horses up here, ancient horses down here, and it all sounds really good, but they don't find them in that order. They find what they call a so-called ancient horse, the hierassal theorem. Let's put an H right here for hierassal theorem or for horse. Then they find a modern horse under it. It wouldn't be directly under it, but it would be in the layer of rock that is under it, maybe someplace else, okay? Obviously, buried in that same layer, though. So if modern horses are already on the scene before the ancient horse is around, how can this be the ancestor of this? It, it can't be true. And it's been, it just can't be. Um, the little hyrasal theorem is not even a horse. It's just exactly like the hyrax, little rock badger, I believe, that's still running around today in the country of Turkey and in East Africa. So if they're still alive, then it's certainly not the ancestor. You couldn't prove any evolution from the 
a little bitty hyracotherum. Fourthly, the number of ribs are different, the number of toes are different, and the teeth are very different. The little hyracotherum has sharp pointed teeth. The little the horse today has a flat chewing a tooth for grinding, you know, grasses. That's what it eats. They're not related to each other. Fifthly, down in South America, when they find the fossils, the three toed horses are on top, the one toed horses are on the bottom. Absolutely reverse order from what is predicted by the theory. Now, the way theories are supposed to work, you create a theory, you look for evidence. If you find evidence that says, hey, this theory is wrong, well, then you throw the theory away and you get a new one. And that happens all through science except when it comes to evolution. Because this theory is foundational for many other things, like a new world order coming soon to a city near you. Okay? They're never found in the order presented. Three-toed and one-toed horses are found side by side in the same strata. How can one be the ancestor to the other? Now, the evolutionist will say to this one, they'll say, well, that's because the three-toed were gradually being phased out and the one-toed, you know, are better and they took over, but you just happened to find two in the same area during the time that they were being, you know, phased out. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. You can believe that if you want, but that's not science. Uh, Frank Sherwin, a good friend of mine, has uh, at Institute for Creation Research, has a lot of information on the horse evolution if you want to get a hold of him. And there's a, in the book Noah to, Ad Noah to Abram, The Turbulent Years, which we offer through our ministry, it's a really good one that has a section on this horse evolution, which has been proven wrong some time ago. One man named Dan Hicks in Tulsa, Oklahoma, kept after the Tulsa Zoo, saying, why do you have this thing on display? It's been proven wrong years ago. They, I, he, I've got all the letters that Dan sent to the zoo, and the zoo sent back to him. When he wrote to the zoo director and said, why, have you, why don't you take this display down? It's not true. Okay? The director of the zoo wrote back and said, we don't have the funding to remove it. I've got the letters in my file. How much funding does it take to remove a display? I mean, I'll go do it for him in 10 minutes, okay? Give me a screwdriver and a hammer. We'll get it out of there. <laughs> it's not a problem. So Dan had to get 2,000 signatures. He t took up a petition. 2,000 people signed the petition saying, get this thing out of our zoo. Finally, they took it out. Now, if, w if they had had a display in the zoo, like... Uh, Christmas scene representing Christ in the manger, one signature would have gotten it out, right? One person would complain about some, you know, singing some Christmas song in a public school, and they'll take it out. Here you get 2,000 people complain before they finally reluctantly re <laughs> remove the display. But I was up at Peabody Museum. I've been there many times. Every time I go to Connecticut area, I stop in the Peabody just to keep my blood boiling. Because they still have the horse evolution on display there. New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah. Did I say? I said Connecticut, right? When I get it. Boston. Okay, it's in Connecticut, yeah. Uh, the, when I stood there by that display, hundreds of kids came through. School group after school group. I mean, all day long, there's groups of parents and teachers bringing their kids through these museums. Never one word was said about this being wrong. Now, it's never been true. But it was demonstrated to be wrong 50 years ago. How many kids have been brainwashed by seeing this? See, the average student in school, he reads his textbook, and then he goes to a museum, and he sees this stuff on display, and he thinks, wow, it must be true, it's been proven. So, to try to get this stuff out of the textbooks, that's not trying to get the Bible in. I just want this out. I just spent the last half hour talking to one of the Arkansas representatives from the state of Arkansas in, in Little Rock. He's a representative there. He was at the seminar I did a couple weeks ago in uh, Springdale, Arkansas. He said, Brother Hovind, I'm a, I'm a representative here in the House of Representatives, and you've got a bunch of Christians up here in the House and in the Senate that love your material, and we are going to write a law, uh, try to pass a law that requires the Arkansas textbooks to be accurate, and we're going to say in the law, Arkansas will not provide funding for any books that contain the following information. Wow. About time. Every state ought to do that, you know. I said, you send me your textbooks, I'll go through them with a fine-tooth comb, and I'll tell you what needs to be removed. There's an excellent book, if you want all of the documentation on this type of stuff, written just 1999, uh, Icons of Evolution. It's only available in hardback, so it's kind of expensive, but 
It is really tremendous. He goes through 15 different chapters, uh, each chapter, one whole chapter about the horse evolution. One whole chapter about the gill slits, you know. If you want to document where things have been proven wrong, this guy has done a marvelous job. But in, and I don't know if he's a creationist or an evolutionist. doesn't matter. He's a researcher, okay? You can get it through our ministry, through our bookstore out here. What they'll do, though, for the textbooks, they will arrange some animals in order, like this one. Shows, you know, the uh, one bigger animal on top and a smaller animal on the bottom. Now, what's that do psychologically for the student who sees this? He thinks, wow, this is proof. Putting pictures on a page in a book is not evidence. It's evidence you have a good imagination. This is brainwashing, folks. You, first of all, they don't find the animals in the order that they predict. And even if you do find an animal buried on top of another animal, that doesn't prove they're related. Doesn't prove anything. Look, if I get buried on top of a hamster, does that prove he's my grandpa? <laughs> you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. That doesn't prove a thing. So just because you find uh, fossil A here and fossil B here and fossil C here, so <laughs> you found three bones in the dirt. That's all you found. <laughs> you don't know any relationship. Um, I've been doing years and years of research, though, on the evolution of the fork. Based on very, very fragmentary evidence I have found over the years, I've been able to piece together how forks evolved. I want you to know, folks, I put a lot of research into this, all non-taxpayer funded. This was just privately on a private grant from my wife. I was allowed to research the evolution of silverware. I believe after intensive research, I discovered, of course, many things that did not survive. Mutants that, you know, weren't quite usable for some reason, and so they were thrown away. But I believe that knives probably came first. Very simple, notice nice, neat, clean lines, not complicated at all. Slowly, over many millions of years, the knife evolved to a spoon. Great geological pressures would squeeze it and dish it out, made it wider. We just happened to get them that have the curved side on the right side to be useful to us. Can you imagine if spoons were all curved on the wrong side? You go to get your soup, it all falls off. Well, it's a good thing evolution was so good to us, it made the curved side on the top instead of on the bottom. And then very slowly, over millions of years, the spoon got grooves cut in the end, probably by erosion. I'm not sure about that. Slowly, the grooves got deeper and longer and wider, and it went from a short time fork to a long time fork. While I was researching this, I became to quickly realize I have a missing link. So right between the spoons and the forks, there's a serious missing link because spoons are rounded and have no grooves. Now, forks are squared and have grooves. That is two jumps. I don't think even punctuated equilibrium could do that. So I knew I had a missing link, but I just couldn't find it. Until one day I was flying to Connecticut to preach, and the stewardess walked down the aisle. Here we were, 30,000 feet off the ground. Stewardess walks down the aisle and handed me the missing link. I don't think she knew what she had, but my trained scientific eye picked it up right away. I said, wow, I got it. The missing link. Later that day, the preacher said, hey, you want to go get some chicken for supper? I said, that'd be great, brother. We went to Popeye's Fried Chicken, and I found another missing link, folks. There they are, the missing links. So the evolution of silverware is nearly complete, which means I need to get a government grant now to re you know, renew my research and continue. About 30 or 40 million ought to do it. Now, Eric, think we could finish up on this for 30 or 40 million? By the way, while I was doing research on this, people sent me stuff from all over the country, thinking they may have found you know, a link in this. There were some very obvious frauds. Somebody tried to pass off what is anybody should be able to tell. This is a fork head on a spoon handle. I didn't fall for it. I caught it right away. They glued them together, and they didn't get it past me. I just want you to know. So we do thorough research in this field. <laughs> Arranging things in order doesn't prove a thing. If you arrange words in order, uh, Alan Lawrence uh, in the wheelchair, a good friend of ours here, uh, Alan spent a lot, quite a bit of while, putting quite a bit of time putting words together to show how that you can turn a cat to a cot to a dot to a dog, changing one letter at a time. Does that prove the cat and the dog are closely related with only two intermediate species between them? No. Matter of fact, if you play around with this for a while, you can turn yourself into a fool before you know it. <laughs> That's exactly what's happened to those who believe we all came from a rock, and Satan is laughing at them, and it's tragic. See, they're not the enemy. The devil's the enemy. And we've got to somehow learn to love the sinner and hate the sin, you know.
these guys who believe in evolution are not the enemy. They're the mission field. But as long as they're hurting other students, I think somebody ought to stand up to them and say, look, what you're doing is dangerous, it's wrong, you're, you're destroying the faith of other students, knock it off. Okay? Um, textbooks now are teaching that dinosaurs turned to birds. This article says birds or dinosaurs are alive as birds. Well, I'm sorry, that is just simply a lie that has been proven wrong some time ago. That is ridiculous, of course, to change a dinosaur to a bird. Back in October 99, articles came out all over the papers, all over the world, saying that we have another missing link. We have proven evolution. We found a missing link between birds and dinosaurs. National Geographic, October 99. Proof, breaking news, the missing link. We found it, folks. January 2000. Oops, sorry, it was a fake. They were fooled. Somebody had created this fossil. I guess they realized, you know, there's only been a few of these Archaeopteryx fossils found. And they're selling, if you could buy one, for millions of dollars. So all one guy would have to do is take five years out of his life and very carefully construct a fraud fossil. And he could make a bunch of money. So retire, him and the whole family, retire for, for life. They had a deal in the paper a couple months ago about this fossil that's been on display for years in this museum. They're so proud of it. It's over 100 years it was on display. Then the plaster started falling off. They realized they were, the whole thing was, it had been faked <laughs> 100 years ago. It lasted 100 years before it fell apart, so I'm sure the guy spent his money and retired a long time ago. <laughs> okay. See, some people are so anxious to believe this theory, they will not look critically at the evidence that's presented. Now, they will look critically at stuff for creation, but they don't look critically at stuff for their own theory. The skeptics groups all over the country have this problem. They are so blinded, they won't even look at... They say, oh, I'm a skeptic. Well, I, I will ask them, are you skeptical of evolution? No, 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 I'm only skeptical of creation. Okay, <laughs> well, then you're not a skeptic. Okay, you're biased. Um, there's a great article here in uh, uh, USA Today from February 3rd of the year 2000. Let's just read this here, because we got to, uh, those that are taking this course want to get all the details. Here's the details on proving that this thing was proven the, not true. Okay? From the remote, however you pronounce that, province in China, an unusual dinosaur fossil has made a mysterious journey from the hands of Chinese smugglers to the polished halls of the National Geographic Society in Washington. And like some, cursed from a mummy's tomb, the Archaeoraptor, which is what they named it, supposed, supposedly a bird-like creature with the tail of a meat-eating dinosaur, has brought to those who would possess it what may be remembered as modern paleontology's greatest embarrassment. It now appears, after several months of suspicion and consternation, that this true missing link in the complex chain between dinosaurs and birds somehow sprouted its remarkable tail not 120 million years ago, but only a short time before being smuggled out of China. Whether a deliberate fake or an honest mistake, it is the tail of a tail that has children believing in feathered dinosaurs that never existed. Prominent scientists calling each other names and two respected science publications under assault. And just as the plot thickens, scientists in China have told USA Today that they have discovered yet another faked tale. This one added by an entrepreneurial Chinese farmer to a flying pterosaur, pterodactyl. That one appears to have fooled another group of relatives, another group of scientists, as well as the editors of the British journal Nature. Uh, Storrs Olson, curator of birds at the Smithsonian's Institute, National National Museum of Natural History, turned the spotlight on the whole mess. Those involved with the scientific gaffe agree that Olson tried to warn officials at National Geographic in a letter sent November 1st that the organization was headed for embarrassment if it endorsed the fossil. Both of the faked fossils were intended to support the theory that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Now Olson, who is an outspoken opponent of the theory, is taking advantage of this moment to renew an old debate on the origin of birds. The popular view, thanks most recently to the fictitious Jurassic Park, is that birds evolved from dinosaurs. National Geographic and Nature have co-published magazine articles and scientific papers supporting the view. Museums, including the American Museum of Natural History in New York, also promote exhibits of the dinosaur origin of birds. But Olson and a group of academic ornith orth ornithologists, a person who studies birds, have been arguing, often bitterly for years, that birds evolved independently of dinosaurs. 
They believed that dinosaurs and birds had a common ancestor that lived in trees and that dinosaurs were, after all, cold-blooded. Like the Chinese dino bird, the Archaeopteryx is fake, too. The following excerpt is taken from the website creationscience.com, which is uh, Walt Brown's website. Tremendous material, by the way. Um, honest disagreement over whether Archaeopteryx was a, not a forgery was possible uh, until 1986, when a definitive test was performed. An X-ray resonance spectrograph of the British Museum fossil showed the material containing the feather impressions differed slightly from the rest of the f fossil slab. Differed, I'm sorry, differed significantly from the rest of the slab. In other words, it was made of a paste. Someone apparently had taken the rock, ground up some of it to powder, made a paste out of it, and then put feather impressions in it. Some people are really desperate to believe this theory, and so they will accept it. But guess what? Textbooks are still teaching today. Dinosaurs are the descendants of birds. Now, it takes a while to get textbooks accurate, I understand that. But somebody in the different towns, if we're supposed to be the salt of the earth, okay, salt preserves. Who's going to preserve? I mean, tomorrow morning, kids in Escambia County, Florida, are going to be taught this. Well, let's do something about it, okay? <laughs> let's fix it. There are several ways to fix the problem. We'll get into that later in this course. But <clears throat> one way is just simply educate all the students. Grassroots. That is unstoppable but it takes a long time to accomplish that. The other way is to educate all the teachers. Just get all the teachers where they don't believe in this theory. The third and more complicated and much slower way, and probably least likely to succeed way, is to pass laws, uh, you know, try to attack the capital, and say, look, get this stuff out of the books. And I think we should work on all three fronts on that one. But telling kids that dinosaurs turn to birds is ridiculous. Look, in case you don't know, you don't just put a few feathers on a dinosaur and say, let's go, man, try it, it won't hurt too bad. Okay? It's not quite that simple. Dinosaurs are very, very different from birds. Somewhere along the line, if he's going to turn from a dinosaur to a bird, his front legs are going to have to turn to wings. Which means, at, say, 50% of the way, he's got a half leg and a half wing. It's not enough to fly yet, but now he can't run very good either. Very well, Jan, English teacher, right? Um, so, he's gonna, who's going to feed this critter? He can't run and he can't fly. Think the other animals are going to bring him food and feel sorry for him while he's slowly evolving into something else? See, in order for evolution to work, all of the intermediate stages have to be superior to the original. Nobody's ever demonstrated that. Not one time has that been demonstrated, that, that it's even possible. Secondly, we never see any animal produce a different kind of animal. Nobody ever observes any of this. It's pure fiction. They make it up. There's a textbook from Glencoe, uh, 99 edition, saying, we have evidence from science that dinosaurs turn to birds. They're still teaching this stuff. Dinosaurs did not turn to birds. Alan Fiducia is considered one of the world's experts on birds. Okay? He teaches at university uh, in North Carolina. UNC, uh, Chapel Hill, he said, <clears throat> and I quote, Paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, but it's not. It is a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. The word archaeo will be a good quiz question here. Archaeo means ancient. <clears throat> and pteryx is a Greek word, or Latin or whatever, for wing. So Archaeopteryx is ancient wing. If it, has, if it has the word archaeo in it, it means old or ancient, okay? Um, he says it's a perching bird. See, a bird's foot has a claw sticking out the back. One of his toes comes out the back so he can land and grab a tree branch. Reptiles don't have that. So just the toe structure <clears throat> would have to radically change to go from a walking foot to a grasping foot. Not too many birds do a lot of both, okay? They either nest in trees a lot, or they walk on the ground a lot. But it's difficult for a bird that walks on the ground a lot to be comfortable nesting in trees, because the toes are different. They're designed for what they're designed for. So Archaeopteryx means ancient wing. Archaeo is word ancient. They will point out that the Archaeopteryx has claws on his wings. <clears throat> now let me point out to you, 
only six, I believe now, five or six Archaeopteryx fossils have been found. The first one was found in Germany in, I think, 1859, somewhere around that date, okay? What was going on around 1859? <coughs> Darwin's book. People are looking to criticize the Bible anyway. A lot of countries have thrown off the king, anti-monarchy, and the Bible says honor the king, and so they thought the Bible was an obstacle. There was a real problem in the world in the early and mid-1800s where evolution came along at the right time where it was readily accepted. They're looking for this theory anyway. Also, evolution teaches, we'll get into more of this later, that different races might be superior to other races. 1859, we had slavery in this country. Civil War wasn't fought till a couple years later. Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation wasn't until 1863. So when Darwin came out and said there are favored races, some people said, well, hey, obviously that's the whites over the blacks. Hitler comes along and says, no, obviously that's the Norwegians and the Germans, the blonde hair, blue eyed, you know, they were the superior race. And a lot of people use this theory to justify what was already happening or what they're already doing anyway. And then along came guys who said, well, hey, if evolution is true, then there are no moral rules. There are no standards. By the way, it is a good, fair question. If evolution is true, how do you tell right from wrong? Yeah, you don't, you don't ask the question, what's right and what's wrong? You ask, first of all, how do you tell what's right and wrong? How do you make this decision? And that's a critical issue you've got to talk about. Now, there are quite a few birds today that have claws on their wings. At least 12 birds right now have claws on their wings. This fellow says, Stahl adds that some ornithologists call the Hoatzin. A Hoatzin is, is uh, a bird that lives in South America. They call it the stink bird because it smells so bad. I guess that's how it you know, repels predators, okay? It just, who'd want to eat it? You know, you get close, and I'm hungry, but no thanks, you know? The Hoatzin does not fly um, long distances, okay? It's a poor flyer, but it can fly just fine. It's a poor flyer because it has a shallow breastbone. See, birds, when they fly, the chest muscles have to be enormous, you know, to be able to fly, flap the wings. So the bone that atta these muscles attach to has to be very deep to allow for all that, like you have a breastbone in the center of your chest, but you don't have, it's not real thick, you know, sticking way out, because you don't use those muscles as much as a bird would, obviously. So, Archaeopteryx has what's called a shallow breastbone. It's not real deep. Well, the reason for that is because it has a crop where it's, it eats leaves, actually. It, these leaves have to be ground up. It doesn't have any uh, chewing teeth, but so it, it eats these leaves, and the crop has to chew them up by they swallow rocks. You know, birds even today pick up rocks so they can grind their food up. So because Archaeopteryx, because of its diet, has a large crop, therefore it has a shallow breastbone. And so some people look at the, I'm not Archaeopteryx, I mean Hoatzin, okay? They look at the Hoatzin and say, wow, this is, you know, a missing link. Well, first place, it's not missing, it's still alive, okay? You can go down to South America and get them. But it is a poor flyer, but it, when it's born, when it hatches out of the egg, it has claws on its wings. And it uses these, these, little, these little claws to climb up trees. Can't fly yet. But it climbs around with these little claws on the wings. The swan has claws on its wings. The ibis does. And many birds, he says, have wing claws. They just never make use of them. Um, Archaeopteryx had teeth in its beak. Well, I point out, uh, only two known birds have teeth in their beak. Archaeopteryx and what's called the Hesperornis. Most birds do not have teeth. But uh, some fish have teeth. Some don't. Some reptiles have teeth. Some don't. Some mammals have teeth. Some don't. Some of you have teeth. Some don't. Okay? It doesn't prove anything. And obviously, a kindergartner ought to be able to figure it out. If you're going from used to have teeth to don't have teeth, that's not getting better. But that's, the, that's an example for evolution. They'll say this bird lost its teeth. Well, how is losing something evolution? That's backwards compared to what you need. Um, this one says, this textbook, Holt Biology 94, says uh, the descendants are the birds which evolved about 150 million years ago. Bird feathers evolved from the same scales that protected the dinosaurs so well. Now imagine yourself, high school student, teacher says, for homework tonight, 
Read the following eight pages and answer the questions at the end of the chapter. You remember in high school, you're going to read those eight pages reluctantly and answer the questions as quick as you can. And one of the questions is going to be, you know, what did feathers evolve from? You're going to say scales, because that's what they told you in the book. It is so unfair to send students off to war. I mean, if the enemy, if an enemy country attacked the United States, would we send all the fifth graders off to fight them? No, you guys are in the Marines. You get the biggest and the brightest and the best. You, well, not Marines, the brightest, but you get the, the biggest and the strongest you can get. <laughs> I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> and you send them off. You want, to, you want to get the best you got out there. And you give them the best weapons available. And you pay them the most money of anybody gets paid in the country. Is that right? Well, not quite, but... Uh, <laughs> almost, right, Steve? Um, you don't send fifth graders off to battle. We have a real serious problem with lies in our textbooks. And we're sending the kids off to have to fight against this. The adults ought to be fixing this one. It's very simple. This is not true. So you go to your school board, your county, uh, whoever's selecting your textbooks, and say, look, the information on page 214 is wrong. Let's cut that page out of the book. We'll get into more later on what you can do about the lies in the textbooks and practical steps to attempt to take. Um, their argument is that feathers came from scales. There are some very serious problems with this argument. And we're going to talk about that after we take a little short break here. They're, but they, they're teaching that scales turned into feathers. Well, animals today still have scales. Why aren't they turning into feathers? How many animals are alive right now that have scales, would you guess? Billions and billions. Do we ever see one even starting to evolve? <laughs> it's so ridiculous. The Bible says God sends them strong delusion. I can't think of anybody being more deluded than somebody believing we came from a rock over billions of years. They are deluded. And I feel sorry for them. The devil has blinded them. You know, we want to try to win them to the Lord. All right, let's talk about this uh, scales and feathers. The argument is they have to be related because they're both made from the same material. Feathers are made out of a protein called keratin. Scales are made out of the same protein. So are fingernails. So is hair. What does that prove? Nothing. Okay? This floor is made out of wood. So is the roof. So are the walls. Does that prove that one evolved from the other? No. It proved uh, the guy who built this room, me, chose a common material to do different things. This one we're walking on, and this one is keeping the rain off of us. And this one is keeping the wind out, <laughs> okay? You used a common material for different functions. Wood can be used to build a boat. It can be used to build a fire. It can be used for all sorts of things, okay? So the argument is, because they're both made from keratin, therefore, that proves one evolved from the other. Now again, if this, if this, had, to be, if this had to be taken to a court of law, It'd be laughed at, but it, it never is, okay? And it needs to be. The protein keratin, K-E-R-A-T-I-N. By the way, somebody sent me a slide years ago that I used in my seminar about this. When I had, before I was using PowerPoint, I, I was using slides. Other people would make slides for me and send them to me. Somebody sent me a, a slide, and keratin was misspelled with a C. I didn't catch it. And I used the slide for, I don't know, several months. And one uh, uh, lady, I'm sorry, one woman I debated, uh, used that as evidence that uh, nobody should listen to me because I don't know the difference between carotene, which is the uh, coloring found in carrots, and the <laughs> protein keratin with a K. Okay? So therefore, everything else I say must be wrong. Well, I apologize for the misspelling. Spelling was not my strong point in school anyway. And <laughs> nor is it now, but uh, praise God for spell checker, right? Um, but even still, that's ridiculous, okay? I apologize for getting the wrong spelling, but I do know what I'm talking about. Yes, they're both made of keratin, but that doesn't prove any relationship. Battleships and forks 
are both made from the same metal. Aren't they? See, that proves they both evolved from a tin can 18 million years ago. That's the type of logic they're using here. Um, actually, scales and feathers evolve, evolve, develop from different genes on the chromosome. This DNA strand, this chromosome strand, each of the rungs across that ladder is called a gene. Those different genes do different things, okay? A certain section of the gene code tells the reptile to make scales, which is actually just a folded, uh, hard part of skin, okay? The feathers come from a different section of the chromosome. It doesn't come from the corresponding section of the chromosome on the bird like it does on the reptile. Um, at the morphological level, studying this thing uh, scientifically, feathers are traditionally considered homologous with reptilian scales. However, in development, that means as they develop, the genes that code for the feather and the scale are coming from a different part. In morphogenesis, in gene structure, in protein shape and sequence, the filament formation and structure, feathers are different. They're different in every way from a scale. Clearly, feathers provide a unique and outstanding example of an evolutionary novelty. The guy gets a little bit of it, but he don't get it, does he? <laughs> he still thinks it's evidence for evolution. But he says they couldn't come from scales, that's for sure. Another serious problem you have trying to teach that reptiles turn to birds is the lungs are different. You and I have two lungs that you, that you breathe in and you breathe out. The diaphragm at the bottom pulls down, sucks the air in, pushes up to push the air out. Birds have a very different type of lung because flying takes an enormous amount of oxygen. So they have to have a lot more oxygen. The oxygen goes into the bird's lungs and goes through all these tubes. It is totally different. Now, if you're going to go from a reptile-type lung to a bird-type lung, you'd have to have a zillion changes in between the two. And not only would the lungs have to change, the blood supply to the lungs. The genetic information to supply that change for the next generation has to change. Who's this bird going to marry? Or half bird going to marry? You got all these same problems again. Okay. You probably could list 30 or 40, 40 problems with this, but the lung structure is totally different between reptiles and birds. Okay, there's no similarity at all. Another major problem they have. By their geologic column dating, modern birds, exactly like we have today, are found way down here. Lower than the so-called Archaeopteryx. They've been saying Archaeopteryx, by the way, we got a new economy-sized piece of chalk here. Uh, they're saying Archaeopteryx is 65 million years old. Well, look at this article. A 130 million year old crow-sized bird dubbed Con, however you say that, Confucius, Confuciosornis, okay, New Mexico Museum of Natural History in Albuquerque. Well, now, just a minute. If a 65 million year old bird is the ancestor to birds today, and you've already got birds around 130 million years ago, am I seeing a problem here? Archaeopteryx can't fit in anywhere. Um, in western Colorado, uh, dry Mesa Quarry, Brigham Young University archaeologists have come upon the 140 million year old remains of what they are calling the Earth's the oldest bird ever found. It is obvious that we must now look for the ancestors of flying birds in a period much older than that in which the Archaeopteryx lived. I want to hold on a minute. Do you see from this statement, he is admitting Archaeopteryx can't be a missing link. He's admitting birds were already here by his thinking. 130 million years ago. And then he says, we have to look for a different way they evolved. He still doesn't get it. He just doesn't, you know, jump frog, jump. He just doesn't get it. Maybe you, sh maybe it's time to consider, Mr. whatever your name is here, uh, maybe it's time to consider that the entire theory is baloney. When the guys came back from Africa and said, you know, folks, we have strong evidence that some dinosaurs are still alive. Then he said, it's amazing they survived for 70 million years. <laughs> Still doesn't get it. The whole geologic column is baloney. That's the problem. Here's another one. The remains 
of a bird which lived between 142 and 137 million years ago, recently found in China. The discovery made by fossil hunting farmer announced by a Chinese-American team of scientists, including Alan Fiducia from UNC and Larry Martin from University of Kansas, provide the oldest evidence of a beaked bird on Earth yet found. The Chinese bird, claim its discoverers, probably lived at the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary prior to the arrival of these other ones and could not possibly have descended from them. My point is, even evolutionists are admitting birds were around by their twisted geologic thinking before Archaeopteryx. So why do textbooks still teach the kids tomorrow in our county that Archaeopteryx is a missing link? That ought to be removed. You can document it's not true. Um, Jurassic bird challenge, uh, challenges origin theories uh, from GeoTimes in uh, 1996. This guy says, there are plenty of other reasons to refute the dinosaur bird connection, says Fiducia. How do you derive birds from a heavy earthbound bipedal reptile that has a deep body, a balance, heavy balancing tail, and four shortened forelimbs? Biophysically, it's impossible. Here's the problems that I see. The lungs are totally different. Modern birds are found in layers lower than dinosaurs. I mean, according to them, dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. Yet they're saying we've got birds 130 million years old, 140 million. How can dinosaurs turn to birds when birds are there before dinosaurs were even gone? Um, scales and feathers attach to the body very differently, and they develop from different genes on the chromosomes. Birds have a four-chambered heart. Most reptiles have three. Here's another very serious problem with this, because a three-chambered heart brings in the blood from the lungs, which has oxygen, and it brings in blood from the rest of the body, which does not have oxygen. Your body's used it up, and it mixes them, and it sends it out uh, as a mixture. It's only half oxygenated, and they can survive just fine on that. That's why a lot of lizards and reptiles, they lay around an awful lot. Okay? They just don't have the energy to run around hard all day like our dog. Uh, but birds have a four-chambered heart, and so do humans, by the way. So the blood goes from your body into the heart, then it's pumped to the lungs, comes from the lungs back into the heart, then it's pumped back out to the body. So all of it goes through the lungs one time. So it's going to get oxygen. Reptiles don't do that. Now, a few reptiles do have a three-chambered heart. Okay. I'm sorry, a few reptiles do have a four-chambered heart, but most do not. They found a dinosaur fossil here recently. Uh, with, it was, they said the heart was petrified. Very unusual, but I've got pictures of that. I'll add it in here to part four. Make a note, Marlissa, to remind me to move that picture into part four. I think I have it now in part 7b, if I'm not mistaken. But, uh, and they found this dinosaur skeleton and the rock inside the chest. They said this is his heart, and it could very well be. I don't know. And they've x-rayed it and said, we think it has four chambers to it. That could very well be also. And they're saying, see, in order to go from a dinosaur to a bird, one thing that has to change is the heart, and we've got proof that it changed. Well, you got a long stretch there from the evidence, okay. Um, reptiles lay leathery eggs. Have you ever seen a turtle egg? You know, it's a real leathery-like shell. Birds have a hard egg that cracks very easily. Watch when they have the crocodiles hatching out on TV. You'll see the egg, you know, kind of crumbles like a raisin. Bird eggs don't do that. Okay? So the eggs are totally different. Um, Swinson, British Museum of Natural History, has, they've got the largest fossil collection in the world. He said, uh, the evolutionary origin of birds is largely a matter of deduction. There is no fossil evidence of the stages through which the remarkable change from reptile to bird was achieved. Notice what he says here. He still believes in evolution, doesn't he? He thinks the change was achieved, doesn't he? But we just have no evidence for it. So he's not going to abandon the theory. He's just going to admit there's no evidence. Well, that's, I suppose, step one. I doubt he'll ever take step two because he loses his job, you know, but he did take step one. Yay. There is no evidence for it. And again, the book Icons of Evolution has a whole chapter on the... Uh, flaws in the uh, bird change. So uh, you can get that book. It's got a great uh, section on that. So Richard Dawkins, who hates creationists, says, it is absolutely safe to say that if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or wicked.
Or this guy's real open-minded for discussion, isn't he? This shuts down communication, of course. And this tells Richard Dawkins' students would say, don't even talk to creationists because they're stupid. And that's the attitude that's out there, folks. Sir Arthur Keith strongly believed in evolution. He wrote the foreword to Darwin's book. They republished the book every once in a while. And when they republished it on the 100-year anniversary, which is going to be a big deal, 1959, 100-year anniversary of Darwin's book, they said, Sir Arthur Keith, you are one of our favorite evolutionists of the day. We would like to honor you with giving you the, uh, the, the right to write the, the introduction to the book. Arthur Keith said, <clears throat> evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation. And that is unthinkable. In other words, you're not allowed to think about that. That's quite a confession. And they printed it in the front of Darwin's book when it was republished in 1959. Well, I appreciate Sir Arthur Keith's honesty. He's right. It's unproved. It's unprovable. By the way, so is creation. You can't scientifically prove either theory of origins. So the obvious question comes up, if neither one can be proven, if both have to be taken by faith, why do all of us pay for one to be taught in the schools? When I offer my quarter million dollars for anybody with evidence for evolution, they will say, of course we can't prove evolution, can you prove creation? And I say, oh no, can't do that. And they say, well see, what's the big deal? I say, well obviously the big deal is, how come I have to pay for your religion to be taught? And thinking evolutionists are totally stumped by that. It finally dawns on them, wow, he's right. Look, if you believe in evolution, that's fine. You have a right to do that. If you want to believe you came from a rock, that's perfectly fine. I don't care what you believe. You want to use my tax dollars to teach my kids your theory that we came from a rock? Oh, now, right there, we have a little problem. That's where we're going to draw the line. Now, I'm going to go to my grave, probably early, uh, because of preaching against this. But, uh, okay, uh, it's just, I'm, I'm not going to shut up about it. Okay, uh, We're going to fix this or die trying. Professor uh, Bunauer at the uh, Strasbourg Zoological Museum said, Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. Long ago and far away. Isn't that what evolution says? He says, The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. On my video number seven, question and answer, I've got now an entire giant list of scientists who believed in creation all through history and today. The guy who invented the MRI machine is a creationist. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of scientists. All of the major branches of science were started by creationists. Now, they weren't all independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical Baptists like me, but they were creationists, okay? They believed in a creator. So can anybody name me, and I ask, this in professor to, I ask this question to professors in debates frequently, can you name me one scientific advancement we have because of the evolution theory? Is that why we have light bulbs? Is that why we have computers? Is that why we have been able to go to the moon? Has the space program... Now, a lot of money is spent on the space program to try to prove evolution. No question. But what part of evolution theory caused the space program? He's right. The theory is useless. Even if it's true, it's useless. And if it's not true, it's dangerous. It's worse than useless. Malcolm Muggeridge spoke at University of Waterloo. I've spoken there. That's where the girl with the blue hair and all the ears pierced 15 times and tattoos on her neck. And <laughs> she came up. <laughs> it was so funny. Here I am speaking on creation in, front of, in the University of Waterloo, you know, Canada. A whole crowd of students gathered around, you know, and we had gotten permission to set up a table and a microphone and draw a crowd. And boy, did we draw a crowd. It's a very liberal university. And she walked right up. Here I am speaking away, you know, and talking to the crowd. And she walks up right in front of me and says, you got permission to do this? I said, yes, ma'am, we do. She said, this is kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I can do to maintain my composure. <laughs> Lady, you want to see weird? Come with me. Let's go find a mirror. I will show you weird. Uh, <laughs> I mean, hair about that long and all bright blue, you know. <laughs> I, I don't care if you're going to cut your hair and call it blue, but don't call me weird, all right? Uh, <laughs> Malcolm Muggeridge said, I myself am convinced 
the theory of evolution, especially the, the extent to which it has been applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could be accepted with the incredible credulity that it has. Why would so many smart people, in other, smart in other areas, accept this theory? He's right. Someday, they're going to be laughing at those people who believe in evolution. But in the meantime, it accomplishes the goal of keeping them from Christ, or, if they're Christians, of keeping them from being bold Christians, because they got all these questions. You were saying how you were taught this stuff in school. I'm telling you, it'll destroy your faith. If you're already saved, it'll neutralize you. If you're not saved, it'll probably keep you from getting saved. That's exactly what Satan wants. He's a liar. He doesn't care how he gets it done. Just get the job done. This man said, Scientists who go about teaching that evolution is a fact of life are great con men. The story they are teaching may be the greatest hoax ever. In explaining evolution, we do not have one iota of fact. I was debating Pigliucci uh, at the University of Knoxville, Tennessee. He's a botany professor. He spent 30 years teaching evolution of plants. He's been teaching it for 30 years. He's received $655,000 grant money to study the evolution of plants. I said, Dr. Pigliucci, what is your best evidence for evolution? He said, the fossil evidence of whales. <laughs> now hold it. How come your best evidence you have is in somebody else's field? I don't think he'll ever catch on to that, but I mean, that ought to dawn on somebody. Like, he thinks the paleontologists have the evidence. Now, if you ask a paleontologist, what's your best evidence of evolution? Oh, the evolution of plants. We've got it proven in the botany department. <laughs> okay. It's one of those shell games. Yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> nobody has the evidence. Okay. There isn't any. Pierre de Chardin was a Catholic priest, kind of a renegade Catholic piece. He is one of the fellows involved in the Piltdown hoax. He may have been the guy who did it. We don't know, okay? Pierre de Chardin has a very shady history, okay? He, he is probably one of the primary fellows, if not the primary fellow, responsible for getting the Catholics to accept evolution. Three different times, popes have come out and said, evolution fits our religion just fine, except for when God gave them a soul. Basically, like Hugh Ross teaches, okay? Yeah, Hugh Ross gets along great with the Catholics as far as their doctrine of, you know, evolution blending in with creation. Um, uh, P Pierre de Chardin said, evolution is a general postulate to which all theories, all hypotheses, must henceforth bow in order to be thinkable and true. Evolution is the light which illuminates all facts, which all lines of thought must follow. This is what evolution is. Hmm. I'd say he's kind of committed to the theory, wouldn't you? My Bible says God's Word is a light. It's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Evolution is not a light that everybody must follow. But if a kid goes to school 12 or 16 or 20 years in, in our town, now you've got to understand, Escambia County is one of the top counties in the country as far as churches per capita. I think Santa Rosa County is in the Guinness Book of World Records. There are more churches per person in that county, I believe, than any place else in the United States. And I think we're a close second. We're certainly up in the top two or three percentage points in the whole, all the counties in America. Here we have, I think, 120 Baptist churches in this county. Probably well over 200 churches of other denominations. There's an awful lot of churches in this county. And yet kids are going to go to school in this county and learn all these things that have been proven wrong for many years. Well, what are we doing about it? We're supposed to be the salt of the earth, salt preserves. When I first moved to town, I started writing letters to the editor about evolution. That's what started my whole ministry, writing letters to the editor. I went down and talked to Katie Knight, the lady in charge of selecting the science curriculum. I went in and I said, look, you're teaching things in these, these books that have been proven wrong a long time ago. I, after several meetings with her and letters back and forth, she said, Mr. Hoven, 
You are the only person in the entire county who's complaining about this. Well, first, I hope that's not true. But if it is true, that's a sad commentary on Christians. We got a lot of Christians who are more worried about who wins some dumb Super Bowl game than what the kids are going to be taught tomorrow that's going to affect their life possibly forever. Certainly for this life, it's going to affect them. And it has cost, you know, all three of my kids are in the room here tonight. You know, when we started this ministry 12 years ago, it's cost you three. Dad was gone a lot. I'm still gone a lot. This is a, I, I take this battle seriously. It's been a sacrifice for my family. It's been a sacrifice for me personally. This is a war, folks. You guys in the Marines are willing to go off to war, leave your family, possibly get killed. Praise God, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're out there defending my freedoms. Well, I'm out there defending your freedoms on this creation evolution topic. We need some more people doing that. Salt preserves. Our job is to preserve from corruption. We're not doing it. Salt also irritates. If nobody's irritated at you, you're probably not a very good Christian. You can pretty much tell how good a Christian somebody is by how many people hate them. You know, everybody says, oh, you should love, love, love. Yeah, I do. If you love God, people will hate you. <laughs> if nobody hates you, then you don't love God very well, do you? <laughs> so why do people believe in this theory anyway? Why would anybody believe we came from a rock? Well, some people believe it because that's all they've ever been taught. When I spoke in the university in Chernovsky, Ukraine, they had 30 professors. Are you from Chernovsky? You're from Russia, not Ukraine, right? Okay. You're from Chernovsky? Okay. When I was in your town in Ukraine, I spoke at the university. 30 professors came, to the, sat in the room. I spoke for two hours. These 30 professors sitting in the room, I'm speaking for two hours to an interpreter. After one hour of speaking on creation and evolution, one of the professors began to cry. There was a lady interpreting for me. They had several interpreters. I wear them out because I talk kind of fast, you know. At the time, there was a lady interpreting for me. I said, uh, ma'am, <clears throat> what's he crying about? And she said, oh, he's happy. He didn't know there was a creation story. He's never heard of this. He wants you to keep going. All he's ever heard all of his life is evolution. Last week, I spoke in Seattle, Washington, four different Russian churches, about a thousand people each time. People came to me afterwards and said, we've never heard this stuff. And see, in Soviet Union, creation was censored out. Capitalism was censored out. Guess what? In America, creationism is censored out. I went to a library one time. I go to a lot of libraries. I don't remember where it was even, but I got in this massive library with some university. I got on their computer Erica search program, and I said, how many books do you have in here about evolution? 1,400 titles. Hmm. How many books by? And I typed in some major evolutionist authors, you know, Stephen Gould, Niles Eldridge, and these kind of guys. Buku books. Okay, this library is jammed with books on evolution. So I typed in to see how many books there were on creation. Up came about nine titles. All of them were anti-creation books. Books written by evolutionists against creation. But the search program caught it as having the word creation in the title or the subject, okay? So I went to the librarian. I said, ma'am, uh, why do you have 1,400 books about evolution and no books about creation? I searched under all the major, cre major creation authors. Henry Morris, Dwayne Gish, Ken Ham, all of them I could think of, okay? Zero. I said, ma'am, this is a university. I thought students are coming here to get educated. It looks to me like they're only getting indoctrinated. You don't even have a balance in your library. I'm sure you don't have it in your classroom. I said, why don't you have any books in here about creation? She said, we do have a book in here about creation. I put it in here myself. I said, oh, what is it? She told me the name of it. I said, where's that from? She said, from the Watchtower Society. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you got one Jehovah's Witness book in here <laughs> about creation. And the rest are, and even they believe in the gap theory or the day age theory, something like that. They believe the earth is, you know, billions of years old. So they're no help. <laughs> they're no help in a lot of areas. But um, I think an awful lot of folks believe this theory because they simply have never heard the other side. Now, I think it doesn't take somebody too intelligent to realize if creation and evolution were both taught to the students, 
equal time, fair, honest, balanced treatment, which one would the students believe? Creation. Right? They don't want that. They don't want the competition because they'd lose. I believe it was John D. Rockefeller, one of those multi-gazillionaires in the last century, who said, competition is a sin. When he was developing Standard Oil, Co Oil Company to the monster company that it was, let's suppose there's 10 gas stations in a town. Rockefeller would buy six of them, seven of them. And back then, let's say gas is going for 20 cents a gallon. It costs the station 18 cents a gallon. They sell it, make two cents. He would lower his price to 16. He would lose money for months on that, those six stations in that town. What's going to happen to the other four gas stations? They're going to go out of business. He's going to buy them. Now he owns all 10. Now guess what happens to the price of gas? 22 cents a gallon. We've got to make up for what we lost, you know. That's exactly what happened all over. His philosophy was competition is a sin. Eliminate the competition. That's the philosophy of the evolutionist in the classroom. They don't want the kids to see the other side. And because of this, many kids have never even heard about the creation story. Many kids in Escambia County have never had a fair shake on the creation story. Here's a Russian textbook. Guess what they use for evidence for evolution? Same stuff they use here. It's the same all over the world. I think people believe in evolution because their job depends upon it. If a professor at the University of West Florida up here in Pensacola, got, if, if one of the biology or anthropology or geology or botany, any of the sciences, if they got up in front of their class tomorrow morning, or Jan at PJC where you teach, if a science teacher gets up tomorrow and says, students, I don't believe evolution anymore. I believe in creation. What's going to happen? They're going to, get, they're going to lose their job. If they're tenured, where they can't lose their job because they got 20 years teaching there, they will demote them to something. Janitor, lab assistant. They will, get it, they will put them in a position where they cannot influence other students with their radical ideas. Dean Kenyon, K-E-N-Y-O-N, he was a biology professor, university in California, I think San Francisco State or... Sanford, I don't remember which one. He wrote books about evolution. He believed in evolution. For 20 years, he was the poster boy of the evolutionists. He got converted. Then he wrote a book, which we sell in our library, called Of Pandas and People. Great supplemental biology book. He never mentions God. He just says, look how well designed this is. Somebody must have designed this, you know. There must be intelligence behind this when he talks about the bones in the wrist or you know, any part of the biology. They, tried, they actually fired him because he became a creationist. There was a lawsuit over it. He got his job back. They put him in as a lab assistant. Usually college juniors and seniors do that. You know, Clean up the test tubes, please. They tried everything to keep that guy, get him out of there. If he had not been tenured with 20 years, you know, tenured, they can't fire him, he'd have been out the door. When we get to part seven, I've been collecting for years now a list of people who have lost their jobs because they became creationists. That's the reason. And we'll get into more of that probably by the time we get to CSE 1020 at the time we're going here, at the rate we're going here. <laughs> okay, but we'll get there eventually. Some people honestly like this theory because they hope there's no God. Evolution is the only way to explain how, why are we here without bringing God into the equation. I mean, why, how did we get here? The four great questions of life. Who are we? Why are we here? Where are we going when we die? Those questions can only be answered with either somebody made us or we made ourselves. And a lot of people really like evolution because it removes God from the equation and they get to be God. Some people believe in evolution because they have social political reasons. Evolution is the foundation for communism, socialism, Marxism, Nazism. We'll get into all that in a couple of weeks. More on the, the history of this evolutionary theory. Some simply have too much pride to admit they're wrong. 
I do debates with professors. I'll point out clearly, look, you're wrong right here. The audience will agree, yep, you're wrong. He goes on to a new topic. They never admit, okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> I've never had a, an opponent in a debate do that. I spent all day today editing the Pigliucci debate number 12 that we're offering now. And uh, I could, I, it's, that's why it's fresh in my mind. I saw it about 20 times in there, you know. You're, you're wrong. He would never say, yeah, you're right, I'm wrong. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. If anybody believes we came from a rock, first place, that's a lie, and you have to be deluded to believe that. So, our textbooks in our county right here, there's a bunch on the table right there, contain things that have been proven wrong many years ago. What should we do about it? What are the practical steps? If I announce tonight that I have discovered top secret information that a truckload of tainted poisonous milk was delivered to all the public schools this afternoon after the schools closed. They're going to serve it for breakfast and lunch tomorrow. Hmm? You follow me? I've got secret information that a truckload of poisoned milk was sent to the schools. It's going to be delivered tomorrow. How would you feel? What would you do about it? Well, folks, a truckload of poisonous books was sent to our schools months ago. It's going to be fed to the kids tomorrow. Let's find something to do about it. Next class, we'll talk about what to do about it. Lies in the textbooks. How can we fix it? Let's do something about it. Thank you so much. Dismissed.